بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وآله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام قيام يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I thought we will briefly talk about our need to reflect and be on our own in solitude and to think of the deeper things that do suggest themselves from within us from time to time. But because we are so much involved in a very conditioned way of living and thinking, that we don't pay attention to those thoughts. So as a prelude, we go into the Quranic understanding of this world very briefly. And of course, we have spoken of this at other times as well. The Quran talks about the life on this earth as hayatu dunya, the very lowly life. Now this hayatu dunya is expressed as an unreal life the least of life. In other words, it's an experience of a particular form of life. It is not real life. In Al-Akhirah, Lahi Al-Hayawan. Allah says, Akhira, that is the life. Mal hayatu dunya illa lahun wa la'ib. The life of dunya, the lowest life, is but vanity and a sport and at times it says mata'ul hurur a short lived pleasure that is illusory it is not real now if you look further into the verses of the quran on the day of qiyamah there come several different responses from several different groups of people they will say we only stayed sa'atan minan nahar, minan nahar, an hour of a day we stayed in hayatu dunya. Some will say a day or two. Now these different responses are there because jinn and humans, they will all be assembled there on that day. And of course, the jinn as extraterrestrial species or multidimensional species, they may have lifespans that reach thousands of years of our reckoning. So they may be giving these responses a day or two. But human beings are definitely offering a response that I stayed in Hayatu Dunya for an hour and no more. So whatever we consider as our life here, the Quran sees it as very short-lived not in comparison only to the hereafter, but in its own self, the Quran sees it as a very, very short patch of time. If we can couple that in with the prophetic statement, Anasu niyam in matu in tabahu, that people are asleep, when they die, they awaken. And the Quran obviously says, things to this extent that today we have lifted the veils from your eyes and you see sharp and your sight is sharper than the edge of the blade. From that what we can understand is that the life of this earth is a very short life. It is not for itself. It is not worthy in itself if it is to be taken as an end. But it is very worthy and useful if understood accurately in relation to what we are and what we need to do. Now here is what I want to suggest, that we need to fall back within our own selves, not ask questions of others and ask them to make sense, but rather look within ourselves and ask ourselves, what is going on? And what is it all about? Now in that process, to take hold of God very, very meaningfully and open up to God and begin this inquiry. 
to say, well, why am I here? And what am I expected to do? And what is going on? And how do I relate to you? And what role and function do you play in all of this? You see, immediately one thing will come to mind that the function that we've set up for God is not the right function. That he will feed and he will give us to drink and whatnot. No matter how much he feeds, no matter how, no matter how much he wards off evils and sicknesses, we are going to die. So the end is there, whether today or tomorrow. Whether he feeds us today and keeps us hungry tomorrow and allows us to die, or he keeps us hungry today and allows us to die today. That is not the appropriate function of God. To dispel dangers. Well, dangers are there. You, you, you can't get rid of dangers. To give security. Insecurity is the realm of this world. There is no permanence here. There is no getting away from danger. So whatever role we have chosen for God, that role can be performed without invoking God. If the entirety of humanity were to start rejecting God, well, God will still let them breathe, eat, drink, live, and their normal lifespans, they will fulfill and then they will die. That's not an appropriate function of God. So we need to ask again, God, I need to make sense here. What is going on? Now, at that point, we will, with free inquiry, without fear of religion, that if I think into these things, I may become an apostat, or I may be doing something to displease God. Without any of that fear, say, God, you are the only one I can relate to here, and I don't even know who you are, but you are, I believe, the most supreme one and the most proximate one to me. The only thing I can understand here is for me to bring about the best within myself because I don't find any other purpose here. I am going to experience anger, but I suppose my inner achievement would be how to control my anger. I'm going to experience greed, but the inner accomplishment is to go beyond greed and become generous. I am going to experience a lot of fear, but the thing I feel I need to become is to become secure within myself by embracing fear, not by praying to you to dispel the danger, rather to grow up enough from within to say to myself, I will face the danger and I will go through it. I feel that is the only purpose I have here. And for that, I will meaningfully yield to you. And with that, I will tread the path. I see poverty. I feel my function here is to address poverty and to bring about a world that does not suffer from poverty. I see injustice and oppression. Well, I need to talk about that. Bring about a world that is not oppressive and unjust. Then we ask ourselves, what is our relationship with God in relation to this purpose now that we are establishing? Is God the owner in the sense that we have to be obedient to him? Otherwise, we are frightened like slaves that he will put us in hell. But when we reflect deep within, we'll say, well, uh, you know, you are beyond these things. You are Allah. <laughs> Even I will not punish anybody for not obeying me. You're my God. Why would you be so insecure as to punish me if I don't offer prayers and namaz and whatnot? You are beyond that. I do not want to worship a God like this. This is a God that I am relieving myself of. I want to get rid of this notion of God as I'm getting rid of all the wastefulness in my mind by understanding that there is some real substantive purpose. God, are you the master? Well, if you were the master, then I would not be able to interact with you. There would be such a lot of layer. There would be so many layers of formality. 
in which I have to praise you, honor you, do this, do that, that the whole thing is lost altogether, that the inner being does not yield to you. God, you cannot be the master the way the religion has stipulated your role as, or the owner in the way that religious people are saying. God, you have to be the innermost intimate truth that resides within me. You have to be that unveiled part that is with me. You are not even a friend. For with a friend, even the closest friend, I slowly unveil myself and open up. You are the most intimate, the ever present in there. In fact, you are the voice that is speaking right now through me. If you are that, O oh Lord, then that is what I'm after. That is the one who is speaking. That is the one who is reflecting. That is the one who is finding itself. And that is the one who wants to complete itself. So, oh God, I will henceforth have a relationship with you that is so deep, so intimate, so unhidden, so unveiled, that without embarrassment, without hesitation, I will explore my inner purpose. And I will take hold of you. And through you, I will find the encouragement and fulfill my journey. Now, Lord, I have spoken ill of another. And that's not befitting. Rather than coming to you and asking forgiveness, I'm saying to you, it's not befitting. You need to be with me for me to better myself. Remind me that next time I cannot fall foul of the same mistake. Lord, in this instance, I did not put my hand in my pocket and assist the poor person. There is that insecurity in me. You saw it at that moment when you were with me. Allow me next time not to fall but to avail myself of that opportunity. Maybe we can try this method to be with God at such a deep, intimate level, where as we are unfolding from within ourselves, he is not the other one, but he is the only one in there that is generating this beautiful motion and bringing about this journey. There might come a time where we call out like Imam Hussein did to Allah and he said well I've come to a point now where I realize that the mother was illusory of course I paraphrase him was illusory and that blindness of love that I found in her was an introduction that you sent of your undying blind love for me through my mother so that my heart may awaken to that inner being that is you, that unending love. The sacrifices that my father has offered throughout his life in rearing me was actually a glimpse of the sacrifices that you have offered for me. It has only been you. You see, if we arrive at that point, then we will understand that actually... My purpose is within me. And my God is my purpose. There is nothing else to it. We need to meaningfully attach with God. Unashamedly be open. Not as we are open to a friend. But as we are open to our own deepest, most concealed self and ideas. And then maybe we can start growing. But in the process of all of this, we will come to a place where we will say, but Allah, you know, I'm not really fond of a God who gives me paradise and who hides away from me. What cause do I have with this paradise? It's a momentary veil again. Like this world is a veil. Paradise is a thinner veil than this world, but nonetheless, it's a veil. You are, if you are not to be found, then what point is there in going into that paradise? You see, that's where we understand that God is not to be found in paradise. He is to be found here and now. 
if we can tap into that beauty right now, we can grow through it in a substantive manner through the experiences of this earth. And in the hereafter, we are with him in paradise as well. Otherwise, paradise becomes a veil and an illusion in itself. In any case, my time is up. I'm sorry if that wasn't very well constructed, that talk. But in this world, we will find all types of experiences, fears, joys, security, insecurity, frustration, anger, rage, greed, lust. All of these experiences are there for a reason, for us to work through them at that deeper level, overcome them and become greater than it all and take ourselves back when we awaken from this dream in a very accomplished manner. I'll leave it at that. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I mean, alaikum salam. Thank you so much, Sheikh, for much needed topic. I feel like it was very well constructed. If anybody has any questions, you can private message me or put them on the chat. Okay. We have a question. Okay, as the person is typing, I actually had a question myself, Sheikh, about, um, so our desire, for example, to pray for others or to alleviate the distress from them, that comes from our humanness or our wanting to like just be loving, compassionate, um, even though knowing that this is part of God's plan. Is that correct? Yes, of course. You mm -hmm. see, the part of experience of this world is to experience compassion for others mm. and to respond to those moments of distress of others by inner empathy and care mm -hmm. we pray for them for alleviation of their troubles and we come to a point where we can actually say that i would be more than willing to share in your sufferings mm -hmm. And that is the inner completion of the godly being that does not take, but gives overflowingly. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so does a woman have to wear socks when we pray namaz and dua? And what about a covering head when you hear dua oh. or pray dua? So obviously you're asking me my views, yes? No, she doesn't have to wear socks, yeah? And she doesn't have to cover her head when she listens to duas, but it is a nice gesture if it emphasizes to the mind the presence of God. So you see, we must not forget that as spirited beings, there is no covering. But as embodied entities of this world, there are manners and etiquettes practices and protocols that we have to be mature enough to uphold as a part of the life of this world. So if you go into, let's say, a, a Gurudwara, I will not take the example of a mosque. As a Muslim, when we enter into a Gurudwara, we wouldn't have hesitation to cover ourselves because that's their expectation. That's their sense of reverence of that place and God. The problem will happen in the mind of a Sikh to cover because she has been forced by religion and conditioning to cover. But if a Sikh female were to come to a Muslim place of worship, she will not hesitate to cover because she will understand that this is a protocol. So a lot of the time that hesitation that we find within ourselves in terms of covering is not because we do not want to revere the place and uphold the protocol, it's because we are resisting that force and conditioning that has been applied upon us from childhood. So we react in that adverse manner. 